Now, is that on? You can, okay, great. Anything, any other prayer requests that we may have that the, you want us to remember? Is what? De Grembel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any others? I'm sorry, my hearing aids aren't. Oh, Bill, yeah. Oh, Billy. Okay. <clears throat> Why don't we unite our hearts in a word of prayer this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these folks that have showed up on a nice cold morning to worship you, to lift up their voice in praising you. We do thank you, Lord, for... Uh, our, the word of God this morning that we can uh, read from and, and preach from and learn from. And Father, we do thank you for your watch care over us. <clears throat> we know, Lord, there are several things that happen to us <clears throat> in our lives, but we know, Father, that you we're in your hands and under your control. Father, we do thank you for, we do remember these prayer requests this morning, the Dribble family, that the loss of a dad, it's a hard thing to lose a, um, a, a leader of a family, and I, I pray, Father, for the family that you'll, you'll draw them closer to you, and also, Lord, that uh, Christians that are around them will draw close to them, and, and they will see the love of Christ in, in the family of God around them. We pray for Bill as he has a broken foot, that that will heal quickly, and also for Edith Colson as she's uh, broken her foot, <clears throat> that that will... And so uh, they'll heal up. We pray also, Lord, that you minimize their pain. And, Father, the other prayer requests that were mentioned this morning, I, I ask that you just uh, work in their lives in whatever way that is necessary. Father, we do thank you for this country we live in, and we do pray, Lord, for our leaders. We pray that this morning for um, um, uh, Janet Mills, our governor of this state, that the that, uh, uh, that you will uh, lead and guide her in such a way that they will, uh, they will govern us in such a way that will not cause us to have a problem with our worship or with our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for our nation. We ask, Lord, that you just protect the, um, our military. And we ask you also, Lord, you protect our police and our local um, um, EMS and all the work they do in this, this very cold weather. And we ask, Lord, that you also give us warm hearts as we continue this morning and that you'll give us a blessing as we open up your word and as we uh, study from it. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good, my water's not frozen yet. That's good. <laughs> when um, <clears throat> I talked to Steve Manley this, this week, he said, I understand that you have um, history at this church. So uh, I, I recognize some faces here today, but some of you probably, I don't recognize, you probably don't know who I am, but I was a pastor at um, Washington Street Baptist Church when this church was built and when we moved into it. I preached the first sermon on this property. They set up a tent over here in the corner, and uh, once, remember that? when I, I went there and I preached a sermon from that tent on this property. And the, the joke was in the area that this property used to belong to a place called... Um, Red's Ranch, okay, and everybody was saying, used to be a lot of drinking and fighting going on at Red's Ranch, but now that the Baptists have it, there's just going to be a lot of fighting, so, but we were, God, God blessed the, the whole process in building this church, it was built quicker than we thought, we thought it would take two years, it was, and it was done in about five months, I think, because we moved in here on uh, that, that Easter Sunday, many years ago, we had a breakfast at the church downtown. We picked up a Bible or a hymnal, and we walked down the street to here. And people started gathering from different streets, and there was like 
212 people showed up. There, there was, they were spilled off out into the, um, the, to the uh, fellowship hall area. So, And also for, for us, for our family, <clears throat> this has been, many of you probably remember my wife's sister, Vicki, that used to come up and visit. And this is, um, uh, it's been a year this week that uh, Joan's sister, Vicki, passed away down in New York. And then a month later, my mother passed away. In, uh, in South Carolina, and we flew down to South Carolina, and I did my mother's funeral, and that was a blessing. Not that, there, that she was passed away, but that we were able to be there for, for a funeral. So I was here for three and a half years, I think, at this church, and um, after I left, I went on to um, Bering Baptist Church for about a year and a half, and then eventually ended up at the uh, um, St. Andrews Baptist Church over in St. Andrews for about a year. And then I came back to uh, Perry Bible Fellowship, and I was there for six years. I did 17 funerals, and I decided that uh, the last funeral I did was um, Ken Mulholland. You remember Ken Mulholland? And I decided that maybe I should retire before they do my funeral. So, so that's what I did. I know the fuel has arrived, but it, I think it takes like three hours for the heat to come up, right? Yeah. I'm not going to be preaching for three hours. I thought I heard Ralph say amen, but that's a... You'll notice some of you got a, a handout that came uh, with a bulletin, and um, <clears throat> I just want to, I'm going to be preaching this morning from Acts chapter 14. <clears throat> it's a little difficult because I, I preached this as a series through the book of Acts at one time, so there's some things earlier than this that um, we won't go through. I'm going to preach on the topic of being bold as a lion. I like your um, saying up here that says, to know Christ and to make him known. To do that, we need to be bold as a lion. And I have Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Now, are you bold as a lion? No, when I'm looking out, I'm looking at everybody. It just That's okay. Then I'll ask that question. Are you bold as a lion? Is her, is her growl worse than her bite? <laughs> okay. Down through, down through history, <clears throat> there's been a lot of people that have, um, that have had to be very bold, and they've paid with their life in the process. One of the first reformers, and this is um, before the Protestant Reformation, by the way, did you know that what the original name of uh, the church was here in, in, in Eastport? In 1797, over in New Brunswick, probably in St. Andrews, they started a, um, uh, a great revival started up. And in 1802, they came over here to Eastport, and they started the church. It was named the Calvinistic and the Baptist Church Society of Eastport. It wasn't Maine then, but just of Eastport. 1949 um, is when they changed the name. They dropped the Calvinistic part because they thought that was going to offend somebody, and they and they um, just became the Washington Street Baptist Church. One of my um, my um, memories from this church that was really great was when I turned 55. <clears throat> there was a woman here. Her name was um, Cindy Mitchell, and she she cooked this great big sheet cake. And she put on it 55 candles, and she lit all the candles and wheeled it down the center aisle. Ralph Hicks got up and ran out to shut off the fire alarm system because he was afraid it was going to set off the... <clears throat> so that was when I was 55. That was 18 years and five months ago. Can you believe that? 18 years and five months ago? It's crazy. Anyway... Back in uh, 1415, just to do a little history, 1415, there was, a, there was a, one of the early reformers' name was uh, John Huss, H-U-S-S. -S. 
John Huss had uh, <clears throat> was a Catholic priest, but he was um, he was speaking against the doctrine of the Catholic Church at the time. He wrote a little book about um, um, giving um, indulgences to get people into heaven. Uh, there was a, there's a teaching back then. I think it's still around that if you paid the, after a person died, if you paid the church enough money they would immediately transfer them into heaven. And of course he said that's not the way it should be. The Bible says uh, that we, are, we, are, we go to heaven because of salvation and, and trust in Jesus Christ. So they, the church called a, a, a big conference and they brought them together in, um, in, uh, Ju in June of 1415 and they said recant what you're saying. Recant what you're saying. We don't like what you're saying about uh, about um, salvation. He says, I won't recant. So they took him out and tied him to a stake and they burned him to death, okay? He was a pretty bold man to stand up and say that. Well, about 70 years later in uh, 15, well, let's back up. 1517, there's a guy named Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he, uh, on October 31st of 1517, he he nailed that, that his 95 theses up on the wall in the uh, church in Wittenberg, Germany. And the, it was a 95, he had 95 questions that he was asked, and it was called a disputation on the power of indulgences. And um, <clears throat> he, he did it originally with the idea that it was just going to be a small group of priests and theologians would gather together, and they would um, uh, discuss these, these questions from the Bible. Well, there was a couple students who were walking by, and, and uh, one of them was a Latin student. So he took the 95 theses down, and he translated them all into German, because this is in Germany. And they had a guy, excuse me, they had a guy downtown who has just obtained a, a new invention called the Gutenberg printing press. And they went downtown, and they printed off a couple thousand pages of this 95 theses. And what Martin Luther thought was going to be a small discussion turned into what we now know as the Protestant Reformation. So in 1520, just three years later, Pope Leo X issued a papal bull. The papal bull was a, an edict that said, declaring that Martin Luther was a, was a heretic. So they had, in, in a place called Worms, Germany, they, had a, they assembled together in what they called a diet of worms. And a diet means an assembly. And on January 28th, uh, 1521, uh, the Roman Catholic Church brought Martin Luther in, and they and they said, "We want to hear Martin Luther's response to the charges of heresy um, before Emperor Charles V." Now, remember, Martin Luther remember more than likely remembered John Huss. John Huss came in. He says, "I won't recant." And what did they do to him? They burned him at the stake. So Martin Luther, uh, they said to him, "We want you to recant." Uh, because he was trying to defend the, the, the scripture of the talking about um, justification by faith. And um, he was the one who developed the five solas. Five solas. One is um, sola gratia, sola fide, and sola scriptura, which is by grace alone, by faith alone, in scripture alone. So it said that Martin Luther, with great boldness, said... My situation was that although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him, assuage God. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. Sunday school this morning, we talked a lot about faith. He said the just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 is where he read that. It's also found in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, and it's also repeated again in, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. So, he, so Martin Luther said, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or clear reason, for I do not trust in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they often err, err and contradict themselves, I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything 
for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And then he made this famous quote. He says, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God, amen. And he expected them to take him out and execute him, because that's what they were planning and doing. And, and of course, it was in Germany. He had lots of uh, friends, and so they, they, they had armed guards come, and they took Martin away. And then the, the Protestant Reformation exploded after that and continued on with many other people. I want you to take your Bible and turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 14. I want to talk this morning about um, being bold. It's tough to be bold, even in today's society. Most of us will never probably, um, Lord willing, will never have to face being executed because we are trust in Jesus Christ. But in some parts of this world, many parts of this world, <clears throat> it... Um, if you speak out boldly, you'll be killed. I like the story about that young woman you said down in Brazil. While she's being baptized in a pond, they had people standing around with sticks. I thought maybe they're going to use the sticks to beat her because she was being identified with Christ in baptism. But instead, they, they were beating off the alligators. <laughs> so that takes a lot of faith to go down into those waters, baptismal waters, knowing that there's alligators there, you know. You're just hoping that the pastor that's doing the, the, uh, the baptism is a lot sweeter than you are. The alligators go after him. By the way, you had a, last week you had a young man here, um, Eric Mitchell. Okay. And he was, bapt he was one of the first persons I baptized in this tank over here in the back back then. That was a long time ago. Book of Acts. I want to start reading back around verse 42 in, in chapter 13. The Apostle Paul and his buddy Barnabas had been to um, uh, a place called Antioch. Now, that was not the Antioch where um, Christians were first called Christians, but it was because there was 16 different towns that were named Antioch. He was way up in the mountains. So in this little town that he was in, <clears throat> they came up against a lot of... Um, uh, uh, controversy and, and a lot of uh, uh, well there were people were mad at him it says in verse 42 of chapter 13 so then the Jews went out of the synagogue and Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath how many times have we had Gentiles or non-Christians beg that the word of God be preached to them again okay but they were they were very confident and bold in what they were saying it says on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. That would be great if the town of Eastport showed up here to, hold, to, to hear the word of God. Verse 45 says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you rejected it and judge yourself unworthy of the everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the end of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of, God, of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed they must have all been Calvinists because that's what that's talking about uh, election verse 49 says and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region and the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city uh, raising up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region and they sh and Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and came to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 25 he was bold but he he paid a lot for the uh, for his boldness. He said he says I was um thrice was I beaten with rods so three times he was beaten with rods 
Once I was stoned, thrice I was suffered shipwrecked, night and day I, I had spent in the deep. See, the Apostle Paul was, 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 um, he was used to being uh, abused because of the preaching of the Word of God, but he continued doing it. It takes a lot of boldness to do that, to get up and do that. It takes a lot of faith and trust, as they were talking about in Sunday school this morning. <clears throat> and back in verse 46 of chapter 13, where it says, um, and Paul and Barnabas grew bold, that phrase, grew bold, um, in the Greek means... Um, that they spoke with great confidence, and they then it's the opposite of, of hesitancy. They didn't hesitate to speak out. If somebody asked them a question about the Lord, they would speak out. Now, most of you today, I know all of you here, if somebody were to come along and, and, um, and ask you about Jesus Christ, I'm sure you would speak up and speak out about it and tell them all that, you, uh, that the Lord laid on your heart about that. Maybe. Sometimes it's very difficult to speak out like that. So, chapter 14. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke with a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks believed. The book of Acts is a record of the expansion of the early church from Jerusalem throughout, throughout the rest of the world. Paul and Barnabas had left Antioch, Pisidia, and they went about 100 miles southeast to this town of Iconium. This is where Paul meets up with a young man named Timothy and converts him to Christianity. Verse 14, verse 1 says, And so spake that a great multitude. The, the phrase so spake means that they spoke with power and that their preaching was done uh, under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. The only time anybody is going to have any response to somebody believing in Jesus Christ is when you have spoken to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 2 says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Literally, in the Greek it says the Jews, the ones who were disobedient. They were disobedient to God. They were disobedient to God's revelation, disobedient to God's truth. And so they are unbelieving these unbelieving and disobedient Jews stirred up the Gentiles. Verse 3 says, Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of, this, of his grace, uh, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That phrase, uh, uh, a long time, could mean as... Um, uh, it, could, it could mean as little as one month or it could mean as much as three years. So all we know is that they were there in Iconium for a long time, probably several months, preaching about, um, uh, preaching about the Lord. And they were boldly preaching about it. Verse 4, <clears throat> if you start to fall asleep, then I'll, I'll, have to sh I'll cut it off short. How does that sound? Verse 4 says, But the multitude of the city was divided, part siding with the Jews and part with the apostles. Um, the unbelievers in this town had polarized people against the apostle Paul and against Barnabas. Um, <clears throat> Jesus said back in Luke chapter 11, verse 23, he says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. <clears throat> And um, we have that going on today. There's an organization called Freedom From Religion uh, Foundation. Freedom From Religion Foundation, if you look it up, they have several um, religious people, pastors and, and, and um, uh, professing Christians, so-called, that are part of this. And what they're saying is, we want freedom from religion in our society, okay, which is... If, you, if that's what you come up against, you're talking and preaching about Jesus Christ, if you're not bold, they will shut you down. These are supposedly religious leaders in our, in our, in our time. Now, of course, we know that Jesus, most of his um, uh, arguments were with the religious leaders of that time. So, 
in verse 5, it says, And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews that their ruler, with their rulers to, to abuse and to stone them, <clears throat> that phrase, a violent attempt, is a Greek phrase, horme, and it literally means to violently rush at them. They were vi Now, verse, the next verse says, um, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding areas, and they were preaching the gospel there. <clears throat> so Paul and Barnabas weren't stupid. They were bold, but they weren't stupid. When they realized that they're going to be um, beaten up, they decided to leave. Now they left, Paul left quite an impression on the area because historians in the second century um, wrote a description of Paul that's not found in the Bible. We don't have any description of Paul or very little description of Paul in the Bible. But in Iconium, um, they wrote a, a, um, a description of Paul, and this is his description. It says, Paul was a man small in size with meeting eyebrows. His eyebrows grew right across here and a rather large nose. He was bald-headed, so he must have been good-looking in some way, right? He was bald-headed, bow-legged, strongly built, full of grace, for at times he looked like a man, and at times he had the face of an angel. He really left an impression on this city of Iconium for them to come up with a description like that that lasted down through the centuries. So boldness isn't listed amongst the nine fruits of the Spirit, which we find in Galatians chapter 5, verses 23 to 23. But we are commanded as Christians to be bold. Um, it's set forth in the Bible as a virtue. In Isaiah chapter 41, and verse 10, uh, God's word says, God says, fear, they, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with, my, with the right hand of my right, righteousness. Excuse me. So in other words, we are not to fear our enemies, and we're also not to doubt the promises of God. In the New Testament, we have a great commission and a great command. The great commission is found in Matthew 28, which says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. That's our great commission. Our great command is found in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, and it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. That's our great command. That comes from the Old Testament, the great Shema, the great Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Shema is Hebrew for hear. It goes, Shema, your Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Ishad, or hear, O Israel, your God is one, or Lord God is one, and your God is one. And so um, our great command is that we are to love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and with all our strength. And we are to be bold when we do that. Boldness is necessary for any effective service. Nobody ever accomplished anything for God in the long run without boldness. <clears throat> like I said, they, um, they, when this place was being built, they said, well, you know, used to be a lot of drinking and, and fighting going on. Now that the Baptists are here, it's just going to be a lot of fighting. So they were making fun of this place um, even while they were being built. Actually, I think it was in December of the year before we opened, we had a windstorm we had put all the walls up, and <laughs> remember that knocked all the uh, studs down? Yeah, it blew the end of the building in. So this is really a great work of God here in, in Eastport. There was, not, there was um, not a whole lot of light, gospel light here in Eastport, but the, the church kept going, and, they, and this, we put this church up. You notice Washington Street Baptist. Anybody here remember, you, you remember Washington Street Baptist? You had to walk up two flights of stairs to get into the main sanctuary. So there's no stairs in here except for to get up here. So, And if you can't get up here, like I saw with uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Fletcher, they'll drag you up. 
<laughs> so we, we are not to be ashamed. Boldness is basic because it will always be resisted. And, uh, and boldness says, I will not succumb to the resistance. We need to, we live in, in boldness in our society um, because we need to stand firm and stand unafraid of, uh, of any of those who um, oppose the Christian way of life and, and Christian teaching. I mean, here in the state of Maine right now, we have an issue going on with um, abortion. Abortion is legal in Maine up to the age of uh, up to 40, up to 24 weeks. But the um, powers of be want to change it now, so it's up to the day of, uh, of delivery. We need to be bold and stand up and, and speak out against that. Most of us probably won't, but we need to do that. We need to call Mary Ann Moore and express our, she's our representative here, express our opinions about that. So, Our society has become increasingly intolerant and hostile against Christianity. <clears throat> if you read any of the uh, Pew research which is, uh, that's out there, they'll tell you that 20 years ago, like 67% of all adults would, would attend church. And just a couple years ago, they did it, I think in 2020, and now only about 50% of adults ever attend church or anything more than a wedding or a, or a funeral. So we need to, those of us who are going to go out and, and as it says here, to, to know Christ and to make him known, to make him known requires us to go out and witness in the area, witness to our family and friends, and that takes boldness because we're going to come up against some uh, people that are not going not to be very appreciative of that. So I want to re reiterate Proverb 28.1. The wicked flee when no man pursues because they have a guilty conscience and because the Holy Spirit condemns them. But the righteous are bold as a lion. It means that there, there is uh, something about wickedness that leads to fear and something about righteousness that leads to boldness. Um, I'm sure many of you have probably tried to witness the people, and so you, you wonder sometimes, how, why is it that you're sitting here in this church and others around your family and friends are not here? Why is it that some people hear the gospel message and they understand it and others hear it and it just doesn't affect them at all, okay? In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the message of the cross is actually foolishness. Now, if you go out and start talking to people about Jesus Christ, they're going to think you're a fool because they think it's foolishness. Now, how bo now, you need to be bold and continue talking, you know. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, but the natural man, that is the, the unbeliever, the unregenerate person, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It is the Holy Spirit that opens up their eyes so that they can understand. But until that point, that's why we need to pray for the lost, because it's the Holy Spirit that will open their eyes. But before that, uh, the, the, the unregenerate looks at you and they don't understand the word you're saying. But we need to be bold and keep talking and keep repeating the, uh, the gospel message. What is the gospel? That's a good question. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is that God is sovereign and God is holy. And that we, men, men and women, we are not holy. And because we're not holy... Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we are not going to be allowed to be in the presence of God uh, because of our sin. So we need, God has set up a way of salvation, which in the Old Testament, you, you remember, was a, um, uh, the sacrifice of animals and, and the like. I'm going to warm my hands up here. <laughs> 
So we are sinners, and that's the reason why we can't come into the presence of God. After we die, we, um, if we're not a born-again believer, if we don't trust in Jesus, then we, we don't go into God's presence. Well, actually, we go into God's presence, but then we don't stay there if we're not a believer. Um, we need an acceptable substitute. What is the wages of our sin? Anybody know? Death. The wages of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, we need an acceptable substitute because we don't, our wages of our sin and what we do is death. And there's nothing we can do really to, um, to overcome that. So that's why Jesus came and lived a perfect life so that he could go to that cross and die as a perfect sacrifice. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous, righteousness of God in him. So our sins are placed on Jesus Christ, and when we trust in him to do that, our sins are placed on him, those sins have been paid for, the wage, our wages have been paid at, at that point, and therefore, we um, want you to turn to Romans chapter 10, if you will. We're almost done. Ralph's not here to say amen, but I thought maybe uh, Steve over here would. But <laughs> Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, and verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is my Lord, okay? That's a, we don't know much about lords today. You know, um, my first name is, er, is Earl. Don't tell anybody that. But they were lords. A lord has complete control in your life. So if we confess with our mouth that Jesus has complete control in my life, and it goes on and says, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <clears throat> that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, our sins were placed on, his, on him, and then when he died, he, he uh, was put in a tomb, but he did not stay there. He, in three days, he rose from the grave, and in doing so, he justified us, okay? And if we believe that God did that, we are saved. For with the heart one believes with righteous, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And down in verse 13 it says, For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, Dwight Moody, D.L. Moody used to say, <clears throat> There are the whosoever wills and the whosoever won'ts. And you can get up and you can be bold and preach the gospel to, to, to a group of people. And um, there are some that will respond and there, there are many that won't. But we still need to be bold and do that. Okay. Verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall be they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So without a preacher is a witness, somebody that goes and talks to them about Jesus Christ. You need to hear the gospel message. God is holy. We can't come into his presence because of that. We are sinners, and we need to have our sins taken care of. Jesus Christ came, and he paid the price for our sins. And if we trust in him, uh, we, will, we are saved. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, for by grace we are saved, for, for by grace you are saved through faith. It is not of anything that we do, but it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It is by grace that we are saved, it is a gift of God, and um, but that that explanation has to be given to people that um, the gospel message. So, I pray that you will all leave here and go out into the world. We used to have a sign in the back that said. As you come in those doors, on the other side it says, enter to worship. And then on this side it said, um, and it still says something that says, leave, to, leave to, um, to serve. Here it says, exit to share and serve. So that when you leave here, be bold. Talk to those uh, people around about Jesus Christ. You're not going to hear 
from anywhere else except for you. Um, there are kids out there, and you'll run across them, who never heard anything out of the Bible or never heard anything about God. Somebody has to be there to talk to them about it. So um, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We do thank you, Lord, for the examples of Paul and Barnabas and others throughout history that would stand up and boldly proclaim uh, uh, faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that we as, as uh, recipients of this information and recipients of, of this heritage will also be as bold as them and go out and to stand up for Jesus Christ and talk to others about uh, their need for salvation. And we do thank you, Lord, for uh, working in our lives to do that and giving us the privilege to be that witness. And we do pray, Lord, that you'll just, as we go out, you'll give us opportunity to do just that. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, folks. My water is almost frozen, so it's time to... One more song. <laughs>